Hi, students. This uh, lecture is over chapter 30, which is on atomic physics. All right, so um, as name implies, atomic physics is the physics of the atom. And uh, many of you who, uh, who have interests that are more in chemistry or um, for instance, in physics, you know, the atom is uh, central to your studies. And so a lot of the, a lot of the ways that um, a lot of behaviors of chemistry are really um, down to applications of quantum physics. And the atom of course is certainly submicroscopic and so it is in it is well within the realm of quantum physics. You must use quantum physics to study the atom. But now we have to we have to take a step back. I, I'd like to kind of start off really studying the atom from a historical perspective first. And honestly, you know, we have two more chapters left, you know, in our studies, 30 and 31, 31 is nuclear physics. The mathematics, the true mathematics um, to do a to do uh, quantum physics, atomic physics, nuclear physics is well beyond the scope of this class. And I'm not gonna pretend to, uh, you know, to say, okay, well, I'll give you the notions of the math, we'll skirt the math. This is uh, something where the math is, really requires, the, to, do, to do atomic physics justice or to do quantum physics justice, you really need to employ all, the entire gamut of calculus linear algebra, ordinary differential equations, and partial differential equations. And that is really the way to do atomic physics justice. So a lot of these last, these last next couple of lectures are gonna be um, relatively light on the mathematics, just because of there's, there's just no way to even approach the mathematics uh, at this level. And um, much more, much heavier on concepts. I will, I will give you the mathematical notions the best as I can, but again, we really cannot do justice on the mathematics at this point in the class. All right. So um, let's start off with a let's start with, with kind of a history lesson um, of where the concept of an atom has evolved. All right. So this takes us back to the ancient Greeks. You know, um, and again, we did not know, as I, I said a few times, we did not know until the 19th century that the atom actually really existed which is you know which is interesting that it, it's so central in our in, in, in the in the importance in science so it was hotly debated so so start off with the philosophers so if you go to the earliest ideas of the atom let's say the earliest the earliest uh significant ideas of the about the atom uh, came from the ancient Greeks. And around the fifth century BCE, BC more or less. And around the fifth century BCE. So we're talking 7,000 years ago. Okay. And, um, and we start off with a couple of uh, philosophers. Um, these ideas, you know, probably the most, uh, the, the main uh, Greek philosophers to discuss the atom were um, Lucifus and Democritus, if I'm pronouncing this right. Double check my spelling on these. Uh, Lucifus and 
and Democritus. All right, so they, um, you know, and really we owe the ancient Greeks a great debt to all of our studies because they really took humans to a level of, you know, of, of intellect. I mean, uh, you know, where we where we started questioning things. We started wondering what our place was in the universe. And so, you know, the, the very foundation of science really came from these great philosophers, philosophers like, like these gentlemen. All right. Um, so they question, they really question whether a substance could be divided without limit into, into even smaller pieces. All right. So this is really the, the questions that these, uh, that these uh, philosophers had. Could matter, I mean, the central question is, could matter be subdivided into smaller units without limits? And you think um, that's we're talking seven thousand years ago. These are very deep concepts. All right, and um, so it was really Democritus who thought that there was a smallest unit. All right, so really the the first concept of, of a real atom came from Democritus. So Democritus believed that matter could be subdivided into a smallest unit. which he called the atom. I believe in Greek means indivisible. I may not be correct on this, but in Greek, I think it's atomos. It means indivisible. It means you cannot divide it any further. Now, the Greeks uh, speculated that, that um, they proposed only a few types of these atoms actually existed and that all matter was a combination of these types. Now that's, you know, that's to, uh, in, many, in many extents is true. I think, but they thought about it differently than, than we do, right? So the Greeks, so Democritus, So Democritus believed that there were only certain basic types of these atoms. And that all matter was a combination of these types of atoms. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, yeah, it looks like he's right, but hang on. Right now, the thing is, um, 
what he thought that these atoms were were the following. So the Greeks identified these basic types of atoms. As um, they were identified as uh, earth, air, fire, and water. People like Democritus believe that, yeah, all atoms that make up everything, some combination of earth, air, fire, and water. He had earth atoms, air atoms, fire atoms, and water atoms. And uh, to some extent that um, this is actually, uh, this is actually uh, ingenious to some extent, because what we really have here is that these really are the states of matter. So what Democritus discovered were the states of matter, the four states of matter. So Earth would be solid. Um, air would be uh, gas. And then go to fire, that'd be plasma. And water would be liquid. So in a way, what they said was, uh, was quite ingenious. That, you know, we had four, you know, but these, these are not atoms, these are states of matter. But you're talking 7,000 years ago. Um, this, is, um, this is actually quite, quite incredible, all right? So now, and again, this, this is the beginning of, of the ancient Greeks, fifth century BC, and they continued their studies. And then about nothing was really done past like, you know, the, the year zero or, you know, in the, time of the Romans uh, to go over and, and, and the time of Jesus, for instance. I mean, there, we, we, science really, um, actually after the ancient Greeks uh, perished um, or conquered, science, you know, kind of took a, took a thousand year break to some extent, right? And so, so we really didn't have, after this work done by the ancient Greeks, there was really nothing that was done for about 2000 years. So 2,000 years had passed before we could even have equipment capable of even detecting atoms, all right? And so again, it starts with the, with the ancient Greeks, but then pretty much about nothing was really done in atomic physics between them and now. So that takes us about 2,000 years of nothingness. And then, and then um, we started having, we, you know, we had instruments that were, cap were finally capable of detecting atoms. So, about, you know, so about more than 2,000 years had passed. Uh, before observations could be made with equipment. capable of detecting atoms. So the ancient Greeks were the first people to give us a concept of an atom, but we really couldn't do much with that concept until relatively recently. All right. And so now over the centuries, Discoveries are made regarding the properties and their chemical reaction. And there were certain systematic features that were 
ever recognized, the similarity between common and rare elements actually uh, uh, resulted in secrecy and the ability to try to transmute one from another. We call that alchemy, all right? So, so a lot of science was done in secrecy for a while because of the natural tendency of uh, greed. And so, um, so over the centuries, you know, the discoveries were made regarding the properties of substances and their chemical reaction. And so there were discoveries that were being made. Um, and then the problem is similarities found between common substances and rare substances like gold. led to secret efforts. Of trying to find ways to transmute a common substance to a, to a rare substance. That is called alchemy. Good example is trying to get lead into gold. Is there a way that we can do lead into gold? You know, even Newton fell victim to alchemy, right? So this is called alchemy. It's an embarrassment today, but again, you know, this is uh, something that, that uh, people didn't know at the time. I mean, you know, we didn't know about atoms. We didn't know how ridiculous this effort was. You know, again, even Newton. Newton himself. Partook in alchemy. All right. I mean, yeah, it's you can understand. You know what was the? You know, we didn't. They didn't have dollar bills back then. They had gold. And wouldn't it be amazing to say, "Hey, I got this much. I got. I have this much lead, which I could get for nothing, and I figure out this really cool process of which I'm going to totally keep secret to myself, and I'm going to somehow uh, amass gold." And they're going to wonder how how is it that how is it that Mark got so rich. How, much, how does he have so much gold? Well, I have a secret. I have an alchemy. I have, you know, I have alchemy going on in my secret lab of to make gold. I mean, again, that's kind of the that's the driver, or you know, you know, you, you know, think I'm I'm a smart guy. I could I I I should be able to utilize my scientific uh, talents and make gold. You know, and you know, and it's totally a, um, I mean, to some extent, I today we see it's ridiculous, but you know, general greed that tends to pervade our everybody, it seems like, um, you know, that I, I can see why people would go and, and, and try alchemy. But again, it's, um, it's uh, something that actually hurts science because a lot of things were discovered and rediscovered because of the secrecy. Eventually people, you know, uh, left the middle ages and 
there became a, a sharing of scientific knowledge. You know, today we have scientific journals. We, you know, we started having scientific journals. We, people like, even Newton, even Newton did not want to initially publish his work. He wanted to keep it secret to himself, even Newton. You know, so I, again, there's this whole concept of secrecy. I mean, Newton was certainly uh, a Renaissance person. He was certainly a person who lived in the Renaissance. And even he, uh, you know, there's this secrecy. There was a secrecy uh, or a tendency towards secrecy. in the scientific community, in the Middle Ages. So um, for instance, uh, Isaac Newton or Sir Isaac Newton discovered uh, much of what was in the Principia years before he published the Principia. So Sir Isaac Newton discovered much of what he published in the Great Principia years before he published. He basically did this discoveries for himself. He made the discoveries for himself. Uh, he once, Newton once showed them to the great, uh, to Edmund Halley. basically of, of Halley's Comet fame. And, Allie, and Halley pleaded with Newton to publish. Now Halley automatically saw the importance that this should be to the world. So we really can thank Edmund Halley for a lot of what we have today. When, we, when you look at when Halley's Comet comes around every 76 years, we got to remember that's a that that's really a symbol of all of our technology because he was the one who convinced Newton to publish. Now, Halley's comet came around last time when I was 16 years old, so it's uh, uh, it comes around every 76 years, so it's likely I won't see it again, but you guys might see it. Hopefully. So anyway, just remember that Halley's Comet, Halley was a personal friend of Isaac Newton. Halley's Comet is really a representation that you know, of, of um, why we, you know, really all of our technology is all started really with Principia. And had Newton not published a Principia, what would have happened? You know, how much further behind would we be? All right, so... When we left the Middle Ages, scientists decided, no, scientists started to, to share their knowledge. And it became, and you became great when your name was attached to knowledge that you now owned. All right. So 
it is no longer considered, it's no longer possible or even desirable to keep your discovery secret. Okay, so after the Middle Ages, we go into the Renaissance. It was no longer possible nor desirable to keep your, your, your discovery secret. Finally, got rid of the ridiculous alchemy. Okay, and so um, knowledge became uh, collected, right? So, so essentially, the scientific community established journals. Peer-reviewed journals. where scientific discoveries became scientific fact. The scientific discoveries were, and knowledge was collected. And that's part of why we moved into science and our, and our knowledge of the atom. Because we stopped you know, we stopped having our own little personal ex experiments to try to to try to create gold, essentially. All right, so we started we we started having this developments in chemistry and developments um, that pointed the way to the existence of atoms, was but at the same time was not proof. All right, and so again, proof is. It's very hard, I mean, it's, it's, and I'll, I'll kind of give a little analogy here on, um, you know, why we could not just believe in the existence of atoms quite yet. Um, so, so for instance, um, in, in the 19th century, nineteenth century, um, Masses of reactants and civic chemical reactions always had a particular mass ratio. All right, so masses of reactants in chemical re uh, reactions always had a specific mass ratio. You know, simplicity here, I mean, I, if I took, you know, um, so many hydrogen, so much hydrogen, for instance, and, uh, and I combine it with so much oxygen, I'm gonna get water, so much water. So again, the mass ratios, if I'd say I, I, I figure this much, uh, you know, certain mass of oxygen, hydrogen, so much oxygen, I will always get so much water. So again, the reactants, the, again, these are the products, the products on the right, are, I said, chemistry here. Uh, the products are on the right side. So again, the, the, this is the reactants and products, right? Well, if I'm gonna make so much water, I always have so much hydrogen, so much oxygen. Now it, it may be, or, or I have so much of one thing, so much another thing, if I'm gonna make something, you know, so, many, so much sodium plus so much chlorine, and I get salt, for instance. And, uh, and again, it's always a one-to-one -one ratio, and I'll get it, you know, sodium and chlorine have different masses and everything, but it's always so much mass of chlorine divided by so much mass of sodium every single time. I have to have that ratio in order to make salt or have to have a certain ratio in order to make water. So those ratios were always necessary. 
And we understood that. Now this points to an atom, but it is not a guarantee of an atom. All right, and so, so again, this point, so again, this was the work mostly done by John Dalton, chemist John Dalton. So, so um, the uh, understanding of the, um, of the um, consistency <clears throat> of reactant mass ratios was primarily done by the English chemist John Dalton. English chemist. <clears throat> so those who study chemistry, um, you know, you'll hear about John Dalton quite a bit. John Dalton. John Dalton lived from 1766 to 1844. Um, and uh, his, um, his work, there are significant contributions to this work came from uh, Italian scientist Abadeo Avogadro. Abadeo Avogadro, so significant contributions to Dalton's work. came from Italian scientist, Italian physicist, this is your claim of, Amadeo Avogadro. Avogadro lived from 1776 to 1856. Avogadro discovered uh, basically, uh, you know, we, we used the mole concept, Avogadro's number, so on and so forth. We'll talk more about that. But again, this concept allowed John Dalton to more quantify his mass ratios. All right. But again, you know, there was, um, there was, um, and Avogadro's constant that we, we use so much in chemistry, uh, that was not, so it was, it was not until 1865 that we had a, a good value for Avogadro's constant. So again, um, we had a great work. Uh, you know, if you go in the 1800s, there was the work done by Maxwell. So Maxwell established the kinetic theory of gases. in the 1800s. And this was the first atomic molecular theory known to humankind. It was very successful. Right. And in fact, you know, it was the work done by the Austrian physicist, Johann Joseph Loschmidt, where he was, he was the first one to actually measure Avogadro's constant. He did it in 1865. So Austrian physicist, uh, Johann Joseph 
assuming that's how you pronounce it. No Schmidt. Uh, was the first to measure, so astrophysicist uh, Johann Josef Loschmidt was the first to measure Avogadro's constant. Eighteen sixty five. Based on the kinetic theory of gases. Of course, the kinetic theory of gases very much points at the existence of atoms. And we go even further back. Um, now, I mean, once you go, I mean, again, I'm just talking really about the, you know, the work done more or less theoretically. You know, this isn't, of course, this is, of course, theoretical. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm talking more about experimental work. This, of course, is theoretical, uh, Maxwell's work. But then you have the great work done by the great Russian chemist, Dmitry Mendeleev. All right. And so Dmitry Mendeleev, I mean, basically, by the time he got to the 20th century, you had the great Russian chemist, Dmitry Mendeleev, who actually devised what we now know today as the periodic table. So knowledge of the properties of elements and compounds grew And um, culminating in the mid 19th century development of the periodic table. by the great Russian chemist, Dmitry Mendeleev. I mean, the layup lived from 1834, 1907. Now, now the, um, I mean, the layup, this is a periodic table that we, should, we take for granted is an ingenious way of organizing compounds. And, and in fact, he used the, pendula, the periodic table to actually predict then unknown elements. So again, the periodic table was an ingenious um, way to organize comp uh, elements. And Mendeleev used it to predict unknown elements. All 
right? And so, so again, we're, we're seeing great developments in atomic physics, I mean, or, 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 or the concept of the atom. All right, and so now we didn't have any evidence though of the atom. I mean, and again, this is indirect evidence. So everything I've pointed at so far is indirect evidence, all right? So um, the mass ratio work done by Dalton and the, you know, the, the um, kinetic theory of gases, all that's indirect evidence. We did not actually have direct evidence until 1827. And it's one of those things, you know, as a scientist, you, you kind of hope that, you know, one day you have your, you have your lucky day and you, and you discover something or there's something that, you know, is, is of great importance. And, you know, and some scientists will work their entire lives and never have that day. And then some scientists, they just kind of trip over it to some extent, right? And, Here's an example of a guy who's not even a physicist, he's a botanist, his name is Robert Brown from Scotland. He was going to his lab one day to study, to look at pollen grains in a, in a, in a colloidal suspension. And, you know, so, and he noticed in his microscope, the pollen grains are dancing around randomly, little, little random dances. And Brown was a really smart guy and Brown automatically understood what that was. That was unseen atoms, atoms that we were talking about, discussing, uh, uh, essentially uh, debating their existence, but never had any direct evidence of them. And here it was, for the very first time ever, under his microscope, was the proof of the existence of atoms. He knew that. So this random motion is called Brownian motion, named after him. So this all was discovered by a botanist. So in 1827, bot, a Scottish botanist Robert Brown went to his laboratory. To look at pollen grains in a suspension under his microscope. And anybody can do this. Robert Brown was the first. But Robert Brown was able to understand what this meant. So Brown saw the pollen grains undergo random dances. Which we now call Brownian motion. Brown understood that this motion of uh, macroscopic pollen grains was caused by unseen atoms colliding with. If something's changing momentum, we know from Newton's second law, if something has got, or there has to be some, some kind of force that is causing that to happen, right? All right, so this is an extremely important discovery in history of humankind. All the thousands of years of humans have existed. Here was the way atoms became discovered. 
1827, Scottish botanist Robert Brown went to his laboratory and looked to look at to look at pollen grains and a suspension under a microscope. That's it. He was going to do botany, not atomic physics. Brown saw the pollen grains undergo random collision, random dances, which we now call Brownian motion. And Brown understood that that motion of, microscopic pollen, micros, micros, the macros, of macroscopic pollen grains was caused by unseen atoms. I mean, it is, it is as if, you know, you go to, again, you know, going back to pre-COVID, um, it is as if you were to go to a nice summer concert. And you have people at the concert, and then and before you know, a little push ball gets out there, and people are, you know, in the little the big beach ball comes to you, and you give it a random push, and you see. Imagine if you could see that beach ball, but you can't see the people. You know, the bush, the beach ball is not going to go in, in random directions and have random momenta applied to it for no reason. There's forces being applied to the beach ball to cause that to happen. But imagine you can see the beach ball, but you can't see the people. That's what's going on with Brownian motion. You can see. The motion, random motion of the macroscopic pollen grains, you cannot see what causes it, but you can, but in fact, we can understand it so well that we can actually use this very experiment to even predict the size of atoms. So this knowledge was further enhanced by other physicists so that not only, not only do you know that atoms exist, we actually can tell you how big they are. All right. So this um this work was um was um, further enhanced by Albert Einstein. And uh, let me mention before I talk about him. Uh, yeah, so Albert Einstein put this work on a theoretical basis. This is one of his, in the year of miracles or Enum Mirabilis in 1905, this was one of the papers that Einstein published. He published, of course, special the special theory of relativity, which we talked about in chapter 28. He published the you know, special theory of relativity overturned Isaac Newton, showed that Isaac Newton was wrong uh, for, uh, for particles going at high speeds, speeds approaching the speed of light. He uh, also wrote the paper on the photoelectric effect, which uh, showed that the existence, of, he, he showed you not only that, that light is, can be, uh, is, a, uh, is composed of photons or packets of energy, but he actually showed you how to go into the lab and, and, and see this for yourself. And then Brownian motion was the other great paper in that year. So, so in 1905, uh, one of Einstein's great papers was on Brownian motion, basically the discovery of atoms. And so Einstein, Einstein gave a theoretical basis for Brownian motion. He provided a theoretical explanation. Brownian motion. All right. Um, now, uh, the uh, size of atoms were actually known. So, about, but, but basically, by this time, it was size. So, the size of atoms were actually already known. So the Brownian motion uh, gets you the, pr the proof of the existence of atoms. Now, the uh, sizes of atoms were only, well, size of atoms were only approximately known at that time. So again, we're still fighting, you know, to, for the, you know, understanding the existence of atoms. We finally know atoms exist in 1827. Uh, the sizes of atoms at that time, so at that time, the sizes of atoms were only approximately known. By you know by um, by 1905, 
and uh, to be on the order of 10 to the negative 10 meters. We had a good idea about how, again, uh, um, 10 to the negative 10 meters uh, diameter. Okay, so we had an idea of how big atoms on it. And this, this, this was based on the work done by Thomas Young of, uh, you know, who uh, we know from the single, from the, from the double slit experiment. So this, uh, this work was done by Thomas Young. So again, Thomas Young came out and performed yet another excellent uh, uh, work. And we know him from double slit experiment fame. We studied him in optics. So Thomas Young comes back up and does something else for us. Uh, Tom Young um, basically compared the latent heat of vaporization and surface tension to to give an idea of of the atom. So he so he. Uh, he compared the latent heat of vaporization um, and the sur and surface tension. To uh, give an give this approximate size. So the um, Einstein's ideas caused the further development of understanding the size of of atoms. His ideas were followed by the French physicist Jean Baptiste Perrin, and he carefully observed Brownian motion. And he was able to not only confirm Einstein's theory, he also produced accurate size for atoms and molecules. All right, and so, so again, Einstein's ideas were followed up by by um, by Perrin. I'll write this down. So Einstein's ideas, or Einstein's theory of Brownian motion, was uh, followed up by French physicist, Um, where's his name again here? Uh, Jean Baptiste Perrin. Perrin lived uh, from 1870 to 1942. And he carefully observed Brownian motion. So we now know the atom exists. And in fact, Perrin took Einstein's ideas and was able to get accurate uh, he was able to he was able to produce accurate sizes for atoms and molecules. So Perrin was able to produce accurate sizes for atoms and molecules. Now, 
essentially, we already knew at that time, the weights and the densities of the materials were already established. So knowing atomic molecular sizes allowed a precise value for Avogadro's number to be obtained. So, so again, it's, just, it's, it's like, if you know the size, if you know how, how big an atom is, you know, you know how many can, can fit in a certain volume. I mean, it's, it, it was uh, essentially um, uh, concepts like this, right? So, so basically molecular weights and densities of materials were already well established. By the time Perrin came around. Um, essentially, uh, um, you know, if he knows the atomic molecular sizes, you can actually get a precise measure for Avogadro's number. If he can, you know, if, if, he, you know, if he finds, uh, when he finds, you know, using Brownian motion, the sizes of atoms and molecules. He, he can get talking about paren here a precise value for Avogadro's number. Essentially, if you know the size of the atom, you know how many can fit in a volume. I mean, you already have densities. Now you need to know sizes. Then you can figure out how many can fit, how many can fit in the actual volume, right? So long and short of it, Einstein's theory of Brownian motion was followed up by French physicist Jean Baptiste Perrin. Okay, uh, 1870, he lived in 1870 to 1942, who carefully observed Brownian motion. Brownian motion, Einstein's theory was more or less a statistical theory of fluctuations. I'm not gonna go into that, but Perrin was able to produce accurate sizes basically from apparatus molecules. Now, if you know, since molecular weights and densities were already well established by the time Perrin did his work, if he knows the, if he knows the uh, size, he can find the sizes of, of the atoms and molecules, he can, he can get a precise value of Avogadro's constant. Again, in layman's terms, Essentially, if, if Perrin uh, knows the size of, of atoms and molecules, the size of atoms and molecules, and their densities, the densities of the material of which they are made, It becomes a chapter one problem. Just finding, basically finding how many go into a certain volume. Uh, he can under, he can find how many atoms or molecules fit into a volume.
And that, so, so again, Peren took Einstein's ideas and ran with them. Um, Peren won the 1926 Nobel Prize in Physics for his achievements. So Peren became a Nobel laureate. So Peren won the 1926 Nobel Prize in Physics. For his achievements. All right, so at this point, we not only we went we've gone from uh, we've gone from hypothesizing about atoms and molecules back you know in the time of Greek philosophers to going through good you know careful experiments uh, you know um, you know of, of, uh, in uh, studying chemical reactions and seeing indirect evidence of atoms to the work done by, you know, the experiment done by Robert Brown and the work done by Einstein and then the further work done by uh, Jean-Baptiste Perrin. And, um, and, he, and, he was, and they were able to um, uh, be able, they were able to uh, develop uh, beginnings, the, the knowledge of an atomic theory that we now know indeed that atoms exist. We have, we have, we not only are we able to detect atoms, we're actually able to experimentally um, uh, perform experiments where we actually can get down to not only do we know they exist, we know how big they are now, and we can actually use the knowledge of uh, our understanding of atoms experimentally to actually have another way of determining Avogadro's constant. So, you know, what's, what's interesting to me is that. How humankind went from 1827 to knowing that atoms even existed for the very first time to actually dropping nuclear bombs in World War II in 1945. What is that? 118 years later, just in just 118 years, we go we go from first of all first detecting atoms to making a bomb out of more or less atoms, really the nucleus of atoms, but. But again, how far we came in just 118 years. You know, not much more than the lifetime of a person. All right, so, so again, we have, uh, our knowledge of atoms has uh, accelerated. Now, interestingly enough about atoms, again, atoms were understood to, hypothetically, to be, to be, um, Atoms were, were, were understood to be um, indivisible. And, um, and yet we come to find out that they actually come, there's actually parts to an atom. All right, so we're gonna now look at the concept of, now we know, now we understand atoms. Now we're gonna look at a substructure of atoms. All right, and so let's, uh, Let's now move on to even a more advanced understanding of atoms. So, so essentially, you know, just as atoms are, are, are considered the, the substructure of matter, Me. This is answer considered social structure matter. Electrons and nuclei are the substructures of atoms.
right, so we're going to talk about, you know, the concept of atoms having substructures. Now, now to some extent, the ancient Greeks said that that the atoms were the basic building block. They're nothing. They were they were indivisible. The very word atom means that. In some sense, they're right. And that if you were to, for instance, have a, you know, we understand today to be nuclear fission or nuclear fusion, if you if you were to take apart an atom or split it, the atom no longer is its original element. It now becomes a different element. So to some extent, they're right. But another extent is that, well, you know, and, and, um, carbon is still carbon if it loses an electron. So you know, so we find out, you know, again, this is knowledge that, you, you know, you walk into this class, you know that the atom is um, composed of nucleus and uh, electrons, okay? And that's not, not a surprise that anybody's had high school science. But again, at this time, we did not know this. Okay, this is, you know, the turn of the century, you know, this is early work done in atomic physics. This was actually not known. So we start out by looking at the electron, okay? We look at the work done by J.J. Thompson, all right? So we start off by understanding, first of all, how do we first understand the electron? There's a history there as well. So, and, you know, so when you do, when you look at electrons, this is what, this is work done by Thompson, but we have, before Thompson, certain people preceded him. So they consist of what, you know, they had to use what are called gas discharge tubes. So gas discharge tubes, The gas discharge tubes consist of an evacuated glass tube. You have an evacuated glass tube uh, that contain two metal electrodes and inside of it will be a rarefied gas, all right? So evacuated glass tube, first of all, you, you get all the air out of it. And so it's just a two evacuate, uh, evacuated glass tube and, uh, and inside of which are two metal electrodes. called a cathode and an anode. And um, a rarefied gas. One moment. I can't, I can't do this. Anyway, all right, um, and a rarefied gas. Okay, inside, so again, in the, in the glass tube are an anode and a cathode and a rarefied gas. Now the, the tubes, um, they're, they're, they are precursors to today's neon lights. So when you, when you see a neon light lit up, I mean, essentially, it is a it is a it's a it is a gas discharge tube. So again, these tubes are precursors to today's neon lights. Of course, neon would be the gas inside of neon lights, right? So again, neon lights are a, a gas discharge too. Now, they're first studied seriously by a German uh, inventor and glass blower named Heinrich Geisler. So gas, gas discharge tubes, were first studied seriously
by German inventor and glass blower Heinrich Geisler. So Heinrich Geisler, um, and he started this in the, he started this in the 1860s. So he's a glass blower. So he, he he made his own glass discharge tubes by just blowing glass. All right. Um, and then. Afterwards, we had the English scientist William Crookes uh, started using these uh, these glass tubes. So uh, he he continued the study, and these glass tubes were for some time called Crookes tubes. So English uh, scientist. William Crookes. Uh, essentially took over the study of glass dis glass discharge tubes. After Geisler. And for a time, these tubes are called Crookes tubes. All right, so you started off, you know, the whole study of understanding the electron all started off with a glass blower. German glass blower and inventor uh, Heinrich Geisler, starting in the 1860s. Afterwards, English scientist William Crookes took over the study, and and for a while, these tubes, and again, glass tubes are the gas inside where you pass electricity through them. They were called Crookes tubes for a while. All right, and so now you have a rarefied gas a current was passed through the rarefied gas in these tubes. All right, so we use these in any, anytime you're in a, in a physics laboratory, you would be using these tubes. We would, if we met face to face, we'd be using these tubes. We'd be using glass discharge tubes as well. They're used in pretty much every physics laboratory. Um, essentially, the, uh, in a glass discharge tube, and I'll show you a picture of one in a moment. Uh, a current is passed through the rarefied gas. Um, from the cathode, the negative to the anode, the positive. Please, you turn that one on, please. The anode, the positive. All right, by uh, by a high potential difference.
Okay. The essentially the cathode rays, as they're called, the cathode rays will collide with the gas atoms molecules and excite them. All right, and um, the resulting in the emission of electromagnetic radiation. And that makes electrons path visible as a ray that spreads out and fades as it moves from the away, away from the cathode, right? And so that makes the electrons path visible Uh, as it as the ray as the ray spreads and fades as it moves from the cathode. Right, so again, the glass discharge tube, you have a rarefied gas in the glass discharge tube. A current passes from the cathode, which is the negative, to the anode positive by high potential difference. The cathode rays, as they're called, will collide with gas with the gas atoms molecules and excite them. When we talk about exciting atoms molecules, we'll talk more about it uh, later in this chapter. But essentially, you put them in, a, in into a, an excited state. Your the electrons move to higher energy level, and then, that, of course, the electrons will then fall to the higher level to the lower level and give off photons. So again, that electromagnetic radiation uh, makes the electrons path visible, and that ray spreads and fades as 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 um, as it moves from the cathodes. So again, as electrons move from the cathode, the ray uh, spreads and fades. That's what you see in the in the cathode ray tube. This is called, you know, the uh, the essentially the the current the electrons collide with the gas atoms, exciting them. You know, moving their uh, exciting the gas atoms. The electrons in the gas atoms get excited to a higher energy state. When they fall to lower energy state, give off, they give off electromagnetic radiation, which makes the makes which makes the path uh, the electrons are taking through the gas visible all right so we call these the cathode ray today we call these cathode ray tubes so you know these were called crooks tubes for a while today we generally call these cathode ray tubes and you see them in x-ray machines you used to see them in televisions and um and um uh Televisions, I think, and then um, well, other other aspects. I'm I'm drawing a blank here. So, the so gas discharge tubes. Oh, computer screens. Yes. The gas discharge tubes are now are the, are now called. Um, cathode ray tubes or CRT. Now 
you, you see cathode ray tubes and x-ray um, x-ray machines. Do you see CRTs? No, the abbreviation and x-ray machines. And they used to be in TVs and computer screens. So back in the old televisions, uh, the old televisions used to be cathode ray tubes. All right, Crooks, among his other discoveries, um, found, so it, Crooks discovered the electrons actually carry momentum. And they and they can actually uh, make a small paddle wheel rotate. I talked about 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 that, but Crooks also found that electrons that electrons carry momentum. And that they can spin a small paddle wheel. I know later that light can do that too. Okay, and so um, Crooks also was uh, was also able to show that the cathode ray and the cathode ray tube also reacted to magnets. All right, so Crooks. Also showed that the cathode ray or the electron beam, we'll call it, in the cathode ray tube was deflected by magnets. A lot of very critical work. All right, so again, a lot of critical work done by William Crookes. But we still had no direct evidence for the existence of electrons or even of their charge. I mean, again, it's indirect uh, evidence here that electrons were charged, but, but again, you know, we don't have any direct evidence quite yet. Now, we, now enters English physicist J.J. Thompson, okay? So J.J. Thompson took the ideas by Geisler and Crookes and took them to the next level. You can see how science is a long process that oftentimes, I mean, that essentially uh, it, uh, covers math, multiple generations, right? So English physicist J.J. Thompson So Thompson lived from 1856 to 1940. J.J. Thompson approved and expanded the scope of, of the experiments. of Crookes experiments. Okay. And uh, with gas discharge tubes. Okay. 
Okay. Um, now, Thompson verified a negative charge of the cathode rays with both magnetic and electric fields. So Thompson verified the negative charge of the, um, the cathode rays um, using both electric and magnetic fields. We're gonna discuss points of his experiment in a moment. Okay. Um, now, um, Thompson was also able to measure the ratio of the charge of the electron to its mass. So again, um, um, so actually before that, Thompson collected the rays in a metal cup and found an excess of negative charge. Okay, so he's trying to discover the electron. So Thompson, collected the rays in a metal cup and uh, found an excess of negative charge. All right, and then the big uh, takeaway from Thompson's work was a charge to mass ratio. Again, this is an experiment done by sophomore physics majors. And I did this experiment also in, in uh, my sophomore physics class, the famous charge to mass ratio experiment with Thompson. So Thompson, um, Thompson was able to measure the ratio of the charged electron to its mass. And we can call that Q sub E over M sub E. And, um, but that's the best, that's the best he could do. Because neither Q sub E nor M sub E was known. The best he could do was to get, to get the, uh, to understand the ratio. And so let's kind of look at the nature of, uh, Thompson's experiment, and then we'll kind of go through some of the basic math to um, that you that you essentially will do after after this experiment. So essentially, um, let's uh, let's look at a drawing depicting Thompson's experiment. Let me share my screen here. All right, so um, first thing that appears is the picture of the man himself, J.J. Thompson. Again, I'm looking at open stacks. Um, this is J.J. Thompson, not Nobel laureate, physicist, 1902. And here's, this, here's, here's basically the experiment I've been talking about, right? So on the top of this picture is the cathode ray tube. Um, it's an evacuated tube. And what Thompson does is he sets up an ingenious experiment. Inside of it, he has a 
large, you know, essentially a large parallel plates on, no, the, basically there's a, the top plate is negative charge, the bottom plate is positive. You pass the electrons through this plate. Now on the side, as you can kind of see here is that there is a magnet, a magnetic, uh, there's a magnet directed. Here's a North pole face on the bottom and the South pole face here toward the, or sorry, I guess this is through the side. So you match an electron going, let's say in the X direction, imagine up and down being Y, the magnet would be in the Z. All right, so the magnet, the magnetic field would do what? Well, it's gonna have a, a the magnetic field is going to be going from uh, north to south. It's going to be going, it's gonna be cutting across and what we would call the, you know, I'll, I'll do something more, what we call the positive C hat direction. The electric field always goes from positive to negative. So where this picture shows it's the positive plates on top, the negative plates on the bottom. The, um, the electron's gonna do what? Well, that's kind of, we'll, we'll analyze this in a moment, but the electron's gonna feel a, a, a force. What force? Well, the electric field, if the electron was positive, F equals QE, you know, Q capital E, if the electron was positive, it would be pushed downward, but it's negative. So it feels a force F equals QE upward, right? And what we would call the positive Y direction toward the positive plate. Now, if you look at QB cross B, if you kind of imagine putting your fingers and I'll, and I'll do this, uh, I'll do this for you here in a moment, putting your fingers along V, QV, where's B? Well, B is gonna be in the positive Z direction, QB cross B, you would think if, you know, the, if the electron was positive, the force would be pushed upward, but the electron is negative. So you have to flip at the last minute and so that would cause magnetic force going downward. So what, what Thompson could do is cause the electric, the, the, he could play with the, elect, the electron beam. He could play with the, with the potential difference across, you know, he could set a particular magnetic field, a magnetic force. Then he had the right electric force to cause the beam to continue going straight, to not be deflected as it otherwise would be if, the, if it was just under the influence of either the electric field or the magnetic field. He can actually count, balance the, balance the uh, force out, kind of like you know, you'd see in the Hall effect experiment or on the, on the test review I gave for you know, physics two, you know, um, or, or, or exam two. You know, essentially, this is very important to know how to, and here's an example of, of us wanting to make the uh, electron beam or the, or the, I'd say the cathode ray beam, we didn't know there were electrons yet, the cathode ray, uh, the cathode ray to not be deflected. Thompson had total control over this. He can actually vary the potential and, and, and let, let, the, um, let the beam uh, shift up, deflect up or down. Thompson had total control over this. So this is the basis of Thompson's experiment. Let's, uh, let's look at it mathematically. I'm going to go back to my whiteboard. So again, what Thompson Thompson did is, um, and again, I'll I'll try to give a rough drawing of my of my experiment to some extent. But what Thompson did is, you know, get my drawing so I can look anywhere. It's nice in that one. But um, we have a positive plate. I'm going to kind of reproduce this. Positive plate um, above and below we have, and this is part of my drawing skills here. Um, we'll say below we have a negative plate. All right, the electrons coming between the plates has a velocity, this is the electron. And well, we know it's the electron, right? It's a cathode ray at the time. We know it's a, it's a beam. We don't know what's in it yet, right? Uh, Thompson had not yet discovered the electron. We don't know that there is electrons in this or not. All right. Um, now the, um, there's a magnet. So again, this is, um, think of this as the X, Y, Z here. 
the electron is going in the x hat direction, positive x hat. That's where the velocity is for the electron, right? The electric field, well, this is positive y hat. Well, electric field is going to go from positive to negative, right? Always starts in a positive, goes negative. So electric field is going straight down. Electric field is going to go straight down. Right, in a negative y hat direction. And think of the north face of the magnet. Right? And the south facing magnet over here, south facing magnet over here, it's going to create a magnetic field. The magnetic field is going to be going along in the positive c hat direction. I should have drawn my magnets over here. North face, south face. Magnetic field, come along this way. All right, so the, the electric field, so the velocity of the electron is along the positive x hat direction. Okay, the electric field, uniform electric field, nice parallel plates. And physics is always comprehensive. We will continue doing electromagnetic theory. The uniform electric field E is along negative y hat. The, and again, the uniform magnetic field B is along positive z hat. All right, what are the forces on the electron? Well, the electric force is given by, is always given by Q times electric field. Well, what is the electric force? I mean, what, what is the, the electric field? Again, it's gonna go positive z hat direction. Now, if the, if the electron was positive, it, it would, the force would be, in the same direction as the field. But the electron is negative. So the force is in the direction opposite to the field. The, the electric force will be in the positive y hat. All right, so the electric force is in positive y hat, not negative y hat, but positive y hat, because the electron is a negative charge. or the cathode ray. Again, we don't know about that electron ship. What about the magnetic force? Well, that, that's this other term in electromagnetic force law. The magnetic force is given as Q V cross B. What's that gonna be? Well, again, in my picture, the electron is heading in the uh, in the positive x hat direction. Q B cross B. Okay, well B is going to be so. If you think about this, this is x hat to you. Y hat is up and down on your computer screen, and Z hat is in and out. All right. So Q B cross B. Well, Q V. Again, I'm not worried about Q yet. V cross. Where do where, where do my fingers cross? They go they go into the board. Cross B. So my thumb would point up. My thumb would point in the positive y hat direction. However, we must remember electrons are negative. That means I have to switch my answer at the very end. My thumb points down, negative y hat. So 
QB cross B, that force magnetic is in the negative Y hat direction. Again, because the electron has a negative charge. I have to flip my answer. Notice that the electric field, the magnetic field, and the velocity are all mutually perpendicular. They each own one of the axes. The x-axis is owned by the velocity, the y-axis is owned by the electric field, the z-axis is owned by the magnetic field. So, so essentially all the angles involved in this, in, this, um, in this derivation are very nice 90 degree angles, all right? And so, what, and what Thompson could do is he could figure out like, well, I can, I can find a velocity electron. I, can, I, I mean, I, I, um, I actually, so I mean, there's a number of different things I can control and I can actually figure out how I can make these forces balance. All right, and so what, um, so essentially, um, the, um, he had more control over the electric field because electric field, of course, was, was uh, given by potential. So, so Thompson, had more control over, over the electric field since he can easily vary the potential. Right, potential V, and we know that for parallel plates, and this is all stuff we've already studied, that V equals ED. <clears throat> all right, and where D is a plate separation, right? We can control that too. But what Thompson's going to control is the, is the voltage. So with just nice, easy changing of the voltage, you can watch the you can watch the, the cathode ray go straight or deflect up or deflect down. And essentially, as you change the voltage, the cathode ray changes with you. You have complete, complete control over this. So Thompson, so so Thompson can um so Thompson found how you know to balance the electric and magnetic forces. We've talked about this before. Right, and so let's talk about that. So electric and magnetic forces. And so again, everything's at 90 degree angles. That means that the math involved is, has been greatly simplified. So for instance, um, if we talk about, uh, for instance, we want to, if we, you know, balancing the electric and magnetic forces, Gibbs. So it would give that um, force electric equals force magnetic. All right. So if they're balanced out, the electric and magnetic are, are uh, equal. So what's the magnitude of electric force? So again, it's QE. 
What about the magnetic force? Well, it's Q, V cross B, but remember V and B are at right angles. So B, B, you know, 2 BB sine of 90 degrees. Well, 90 degrees is sine 90 degrees is one. So I can literally just write down that this is just Q, V, B. And everything's at right angles. The charges, electric charge cancels out on each side. And I can write a nice relationship that the velocity of the electron is just equal to the ratio of the electric field and a magnetic field. Yeah, I can do that with, uh, with Thompson's experiment. I can figure out the velocity of the electron by I can figure out the magnetic field and I can control the electric field by varying the, the potential. That's very easy to do. All right, so now um, what, uh, what I said is that what Thompson was able to do is, is give you a measure of the charge to mass ratio. We don't know the charge and we don't know the mass of electron. The best we can do is give a charge to mass ratio. Some other experiment, and I'll talk about Millikan's experiment next, some other experiments got to give you something else. Millikan got you the, uh, the electric charge. Once you have electric charge, boom, you plug it into a Thomson's ratio, and now you have electric mass as well, or electron mass, I should say. All right. So, what um, do we do here? So we want so why not understand how Thomson was able to give you the charge to mass ratio from this experiment? All right. So one of the things you can do is is look at the electric force first. So we see that um, the deflection, so, so the electric force experienced by the electron, is force electric is QE. Again, Q times electric field. We just said that a moment ago. Electric force is a charge times electric field. Well, we can go to Newton's second law. Newton's second law says that if, if, if a mass, I mean, this, whatever this is, electron as we now know, well, it must have a mass. Whatever its mass, if it's experiencing a force, it's gonna experience an acceleration. That's what Newton tells you. So Newton's second law states that if a mass experiences a force, whatever the source of the force, It accelerates. We don't know the mass electron at this point. But if it has a mass, we know Newton's second law would tell us, well, I have an acceleration. And it would equal this force, in this case, electric force, divided by the mass of the electron. Okay, so whatever this, whatever this, um, Whatever this, um, you know, whatever this mass happens to be, I know that that would be true. So what I can uh, uh, what I can actually now do is say, well, let's substitute for let's substitute for the electric force from up here. So I can actually say that this is equal to acceleration. Instead of F sub e, I can write QE. Acceleration is QE over M sub e. All right, and I can actually write the charge to mass ratio. I can write the charge to mass ratio simply as Q, um, I guess it would be Q sub E, if you will, charge of the electron. Charge to mass ratio, Q sub E over the mass, M sub E, is the acceleration divided by the electric field. Thing. All right, and so we can analyze the deflection between the two parallel plates. Now, um,
the deflection can be analyzed to get A. So we can actually analyze the mechanics of the deflection to get A. So we have A, or we, we you know, we have, we have to, okay, we have the charge mass ratio, but we need to get A, and we can determine, we can determine uh, at E because we know that B equals ZD. All right, so we know that. So the thing is, can we get A? Well, you can get A by looking at the mechanics. Again, what we have right now is that the charge to mass ratio, and we don't, can't do any better than charge to mass. We have this acceleration divided by the electric field magnitude. All right, the deflection, Of the of the uh, beam between the parallel plates can be analyzed. Uh, to obtain a. From mechanics. We know that B equals ED or B equals B over D or parallel plates, parallel charge conducting plates. So we can obtain a value for Q to be over M to B. Charge to mass ratio. Okay, so we can do it that way. You can also do it with magnetic fields. So we can also look at it, you know, we can get this relationship. We can also do it for magnetic fields. So since, so we can look at inflection caused by magnetic fields. And again, you know, we know that F magnetic is Q, B, B, all right? And so again, you know, that's equal to, I mean, it's gonna equal to some M sub B times A as well. Again, you know, if we just, you know, not worry about the electric field, but now we're talking about the deflection for the magnetic field. Well, again, we're gonna still have you know, uh, we, we have, we're still gonna have a, a force causing an acceleration by Newton's second law. I'm just combining, I'm just combining the magnetic force and Newton's second law, two steps in one. And we can re rearrange this to get a charge to mass ratio again. We can find that Q sub B over M sub B separately. We can find that to, to equal um, uh, A over VB. Again, I can get A from mechanics, I can get B from the ratio of electric field to magnetic field. And I can control the magnetic field. So I can find Q sub B over M sub B. So Thompson found out a number. He had a number that he was able to get from his, from his experiments. Q sub B over M sub B. Thompson found a number, negative, 1.76 times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram for the electron. 
Now, that's the best Thompson can do. Thompson could not, nobody at the time had a measurement of the charge. You know, they didn't have, they couldn't just go on their cell phones and look up or ask Siri what the charge of electron is or mass electron. I mean, again, nobody knew that number at the time. That was never, that was not empirically determined at this point. So one of the things that this implied to Thompson was whatever the electron mass is, the electron mass is very small. Because this number is so big. So Thompson automatically look at, can look at this experiment and know that the electron mass is very, very small. You know, again, the charge mass ratio, negative 1.76 times 10 to the 11th Coulombs per kilogram. Thompson went and did his experiment now later on for protons and was able to find a charge mass ratio for protons as well. So John Thompson went off and further looked at, essentially there were, there were helium nuclei, which we now understand, I'm sorry, not helium nuclei, we, hydrogen nuclei, which I understand as protons. So, so, so again, Q sub E over M sub E, this is discovery by Thompson, negative 1.76, times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram. That's for the electron. Thompson performed his experiment with a positive hydrogen ion, uh, and uh, which are basically protons. He found out that another ratio, Q sub P over M sub P, he found to be different sign, a uh, positive 9.58. times 10 to the seventh coulombs per kilogram. And essentially, we don't know either the mass of the electron or the mass of the proton. However, you can actually combine these numbers and determine what the, what the ratio of these numbers are. So if you, if you look at it and say, well, let me, let me solve uh, each for uh, Q and, and essentially work it out. You'll find out that the mass of the proton, whatever it is, or the mass of, of the proton is gonna be about 1,836 times the mass of the electron. So if you can find, so again, these are all important results. Charge to mass ratio of electron, charge to mass ratio of a proton, and you can further say, well, whatever the mass of the electron is, the mass of the proton is 1,836 times the mass of the electron. So again, if you get the mass of the electron, you can get the mass of the proton right off the bat. So everything was uh, ready, you know, to, um, um, and, um, and essentially Thompson though, you know, he did a variety of experiments and, and he also even utilized the photoelectric effect and, you know, he showed the con he showed the electron was an independent particle. All right. So again, he did this these experiments. But he also did a variety of other experiments. All right. So Thompson performed a variety of experiments using different gases and discharge tubes. Uh, do, yeah, using different gases and discharge tubes. Okay, and um, and he used the photoelectric effect. You know, for freeing electrons from atoms. So basically, using 
So this this essentially uses the photoelectric effect. You know, what, what's causing these electrons to um, to um, to remove electrons from atoms? So again, you, you further employ the photoelectric effect. And um, he always, and so essentially, uh, he was able to, again, free, I should say, free the electrons from the atoms. All right, so he was able to start off with this cathode ray. He was actually able to use a photoelectric effect to actually free electrons from atoms. And all of his experiments uh, prove that the, the electron is an independent particle. So essentially, all of Thomson's experiments Okay, so Thomson effectively discovered the electron. Um, so all his work, he finally began to publish in 1897. In many ways, Thomson really could not, uh, you know, it was hard for him to accept his own experiments. You know, it was kind of, he kind of fell into the same problem that we talked about with Max Planck earlier. You're discovering something that is so incredible and so surprising that you have a hard time believing it yourself. And we're going to see a lot of this in the early in the early experiments, you know. So something that was, you know, so Planck, his problem was that light was universally accepted as a wave at that time, especially due to the work done by Maxwell. And here's Planck needing to consider the, the, the light as a particle, which you know is a photon. And Einstein followed up five years later, uh, you know, corroborating Planck's work. But Planck was reticent to publish. Thompson's looking at this and saying, well, there's an atom that we thought was indivisible. And I'm showing here that there are parts of an atom. The atom at least is composed of at least one part called the electron. And I'm seeing the atom has a substructure. And this is a huge um, discovery and one that Thompson wants to make sure that he has right so as not to embarrass himself, so as not to be wrong. I mean, he wants to make sure that he is absolutely, he's, he's using all these different tests to convince himself in many ways that indeed there is a substructure to the atom and it's called the electron, all right? And so, so, Thompson, so Thompson finally started publishing his work in 1897. I say finally, because he was a little reticent at first. But Thompson finally began to publish his work. In 1897. And he was awarded the 1906 Nobel Prize in Physics for his work.
So, as I said, both Thompson, father and son, J.P. Thompson later, got Nobel Prize in physics. All right, and so Thompson, there's a famous quote from Thompson, and I'll kind of reproduce it here. It kind of talks about his uh, reticence to publish because, again, atom means indivisible, right? But yet we're finding something smaller, so it's not really indivisible. It's composed of something, right? And so um, Thompson, Thompson said, you know, Thompson later said, quote him, uh, he says, um, it was only when I was convinced Um, that the experiment left no escape um, from it that I publish and my belief in the existence of bodies smaller than atoms. But I mean, I, um, Thompson was a great scientist. Thompson used the scientific method every single way. And, and he had to detach his belief system from what he was seeing. So again, Thompson says, it was only when I was convinced that the experiment left no escape from it, that I published my belief in the existence of bodies smaller than atoms. Thompson hemmed and hawed uh, about whether he should publish or not, because again, if he's wrong, this, I mean, this is a huge, huge discovery that something smaller than an atom exists. Okay, now, where Thompson left off, Thompson, again, I'm, we're going to talk about the charge to mass ratio. So where Thompson left off was we, we now understand that there is a charge to mass ratio uh, for the electron, but we neither know its charge nor its mass. And so now we need to, we need to, um, we need to now go to the next step. and find the charge or the mass one way or the other. So we have uh, the entry of the next uh, great physicist um, in, in the story, and that is American Robert A. Milliken. So we leave Thompson and essentially, the next person in there is, is the American physicist Robert Millikan. Robert Millikan uh, lived from 1868 to 1953. All right, and uh, he decided to try to improve upon um, Thompson's experiment.
Um, but then he finally gave up on um, our experiment on the um, charge to mass ratio. But he finally gave up on that and devised his own experiment. This is a famous experiment. And it's called the Millikan oil drop experiment. And every physicist in the say the sophomore level of physics does this experiment. And this is an experiment, you know, that is very, very popular and pretty much anybody who is a physics major that gets a physics bachelor's degree has done this experiment. So let me, let me just, let me discuss this experiment now. And this experiment, what it'll answer is what is the charge of the electron? What is the fundamental electron charge? That is what this experiment will answer. So let me, uh, give me a moment here. Let's uh, move on to Millikan, the OpenStax book. All right, so let's, we'll now focus on Robert Milliken. Okay, so looking at the picture here, uh, the, the gentleman you see in this photograph is Robert Milliken, American Nobel laureate physicist, Robert Milliken. Now let's discuss <coughs> his experiment. Millikan oil drop experiment. Now, in this experiment uh, performed by Millikan, um, what you see is um, two plates. Again, this, this is a this up here is a blow up of what's what's in the uh, the whole experiment's really shown in the lower part. But you have two plates. Now the uh, Upper plate is positive, lower plate is negative. So again, we know what happens with uh, with um, with uh, parallel plates. There's an electric field, a nice uniform electric field between parallel plates, going from the positive to the negative. Now, what um, you also see is a bright light. So there's a bright light um, on on the side, and you have a, what's called an atomizer. It's essentially a spray bottle that sprays out little oil particles. Now, Millikan chose to use oil instead of water because oil doesn't evaporate as readily as water does. You have little oil particles that come out. Now, the oil particles, through the process of the spraying, many of them become charged. Many of them will, uh, will become, um, uh, I'll pick up a, you know, a, a excess negative, negative, uh, negative E or negative two E or negative three, whatever charge, they become charged. And so they become affected by the electric field. Now, what, what Millikan was able to do is, is again, just like Thompson, he was able to control the electric field by, uh, by, by controlling the potential. He was able to not only control the potential, he was able to control the potential's polarity. And what he's able to do is he was able to balance, again, these are very, very light, light as in very, uh, not very, very uh, low weight uh, particles, these oil drops. He was able to balance them. He was able to balance the weight of the drop and the electric force. And this experiment was allow, allowed him to determine the charge of the electron. He basically found out that every charge that he found was either Q sub E, two Q sub E, three Q sub E. It was some fundamental multiple of a fun, of, of a uh, some multiple of a fundamental charge. 
And Tom and uh, Milliken improved on this experiment, improved on this experiment. He was able to get the charged electron very, very accurately. So let me uh, so let me talk about this experiment, and I'll do my best to uh, try to draw or recreate what you just saw, just for uh, for um, uh, convenience. All right, so Millikan oil drop experiment. Let's discuss it. So. <coughs> so we have these parallel plates. Uh, let's say the chart, the top plate has a positive Q charge. We have a bottom plate. Negative Q charge. And we have a light source. Of course, you know, you know, you have plates, you're going to have some sort of electric field, right? Those are the positive and negative. So again, electric field everywhere. Now, um, there's a light source. I'll draw it like a flashlight, like he did, the book did. Not so good drawing skills here. All right, here's a light source. Okay, and you have a spray bottle. or fancy word for that is an atomizer. These are oil drops. Yeah. All right, there's so oil drops uh, from an atomizer. All right, now, um, from a close up view or, or remember, for a far away view, let's kind of draw what the plates are a little, looking a little differently. And the, the, again, these are our parallel plates. We have the positive plate and the negative plate. Kind of draw more of a schematic of what's going on. All right. And so again, we have electric field lines that are uniform. They extend from a positive charge to a corresponding negative charge on these conducting plates. Okay, so somewhere in here we see we have the our mass, our body. Now the electric for, uh, field, field um, electric field is, is downward, but of course we know since the electron is negative, its force is gonna be upward, right? We've talked about that already. So it's gonna experience an upward electric force. And of course, it's gonna be counterbalanced by its gravity, its weight, mg. All right, so there's gonna be a counterbalancing. So you have control over that. So essentially the, the ultimate control here is that the weight, the weight of the drop, and keep in mind here, this is the weight of a drop. This is not an electron. This is an oil drop. 
okay? It's an oil drop. The oil drop is charged, okay? It's a charged body. So you have this oil drop from the atomizer. Boom, it's, it's, it's spewing out oil drops. Some of the oil drops are charged by the process of, of, the, of, of the spring. And so again, you have these charged oil drops. Again, you know, the, it's gonna experience electric force. So the electric force is very, very, very strong. And so it's gonna, so the electric force is, it's given that the body is charged, it's going to experience a force. It's gonna pull the body up. The body, the drop will have a, a weight going down. So again, this M is the, is the mass of the drop. No, too small to write here, but the mass of the drop times gravity, its weight is counterbalanced by the electric charge times the electric field. And that is when, when, when you see a balancing, and you can control this. I mean, essentially the light, the light source makes these makes these drops. These drops are very, very, very small, but they appear to shine in the light source. You can watch them and you can very carefully control when you get a balancing, when do they stop falling? All right, and so let me, uh, I need more space here. Let me, let me kind of uh, explain this better here. So again, we see what the, apparatus is and the basic concept, all right? So let's kind of, I need more real estate here. So let's uh, describe, be more descriptive of the Millikan oil drop experiment. So the, uh, again, the electric field is produced by the, by the applied voltage B, uh, equals V over D, right? So again, as I said, just like with, with the Thompson experiment, the electric field, Um, is produced by the applied voltage. Between the plates, between the charged plates. So E again as V over D. And D is the plate separation. Okay, so you know this. And V can be adjusted to just balance the, the drop's weight. So V can be adjusted. to just balance the drop's weight. Okay. Now, um, the drops, they reflect in the light, right? So the drops can be seen as points of reflected light using a microscope that you saw in the drawing. So the drops, can be seen as points of reflected light. Um, by, by using a microscope. Okay. Um, now the drops, you know, they're they're too small to be seen uh, to in order to be able to directly measure their, their uh, sizes and masses. So we have to find another way of measuring the mass. So again, part of the idea is well, what's the mass of the drop? So the drops are too small to measure. Their sizes and masses, and these these oil drops are very small. Okay, 
all right? Um, essentially, you determine the mass of the drop by, by observing how fast it falls when the voltage is turned off. And we know aerosols has a very significant effect on, on the submicroscopic drops. More massive drops will fall faster. The less massive drops will not fall as fast. And so you can actually use what's called a sedimentation calculation to reveal their mass. All right. So again, we, we need to, in that in the equation I just drew up earlier, we need to find the mass of the drop. I mean, that's critical as well. So the mass of the drop has to be done through a, a separate, a separate analysis. So to find the mass of the drop. Um, we observe how fast the drop falls. When the voltage is when, when the voltage is turned off, All right? So air resistance plays a very important role. Uh, in the fall in in the uh, uh, falling of these drops, you go back to physics one. When you have free fall, there's this pure acceleration. But if you have air resistance, you have what's called a a drag force. You take a a body, a, a mass, and it's going to be undergoing uh, it's um, mg, it's weight downward, while there's a what's called a drag force. Drag force is given by one half uh, c rho a v squared, right? And so the, the, the fact, so again, this is the density of the media in which the body is falling, which would be air. This is a cross sectional area of the body. This is a shape factor. This is the velocity and you square it. So as, as the faster the body falls, the greater the drag force. At some point, the body is going to be falling at a certain critical velocity. Well, again, you know, if you want to find out what that velocity is, you set D equal to mg, right? And then you can solve for V. So V then becomes, you get, put the two on top, mg, then everything else you throw in the bottom, the c, rho, and the a. Take the square root of that. So the more massive the, uh, the, the drop, the greater the critical, critical velocity. Again, this is called the critical speed. This, this is the speed where the, um, the, um, the weight, the drag force just balance, and for here on out, the body falls at a constant velocity. Why? Because, because there's a balancing point where the weight and the drag force have balanced out. You can analyze this, you know, and, and basically understanding that there is a drag force from the air. All right, and so this is called a critical, the critical speed. You know, we studied this in physics one. So effectively, using a sedimentation analysis. A sophisticated sedimentation analysis, Millikan is able to get the mass, the mass of the drop. So Millikan uh, utilized the aforementioned concepts and employed a 
sophisticated sedimentation process. Sedimentation analysis to determine the mass of the oil drops. M drop. All right, and that's M drop. So now we know M drop. Now what do we do? Well, at that point, we know we know the following. We know that we know that. Uh, M drop times gravity, or i.e. the weight, is QE, Le electric uh, charge times the electric field. All right. Um, we know that V equals, or that E equals V over D. That means that M drop times G is now going to be um, uh, Q sub E times V over D. Okay, using simple physics here. And now we can solve for Q sub E. The fundamental electric charge. And it's going to be uh, M drop G D divided by V. All right, we can find M drop through the sedimentation tech analysis. We know the acceleration of gravity. We know the plate separation in the Millikan drop experiment. We can Millikan oil drop experiment, and we can very easily control. We can dial up the potential. All of these are easily controllable in the lab, and we can determine this. You know, again from the from the other analysis. We now have a fundamental, fundamental electric charge. You'll find out that you have to do a little histogram analysis. You'll find out that some of the charges come out. Some of the drops are charged as, as Q sub E. Some of them are two Q sub E. Some of them are three Q sub E and so on and so forth. But in general, they're all fundamental. They're all multiples of one fundamental charge. We now finally have... An, uh, an answer to what at least one of the two one of the two uh, things are. What is the mass electron? What is the charge electron? We finally now have the charge electron. And given we have uh, we have um, Thomson's charge to mass ratio, we can then plug that in and very quickly get the mass of the electron. All right. So again, this is the product of Millikan's experiments. Uh, by, by 1913, Millikan kept doing his experiments. By 1913, Millikan had measured the charge of the electron Q sub E to an accuracy of 1%. So Millikan had improved his experiment to measure the charge of the electron to within an accuracy of 1%. And 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 in the following years, he improved this accuracy by a factor of ten yet again.
So when Milliken, his, his, the number he came up with is that Q sub E is negative 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. And again, we've been using this number throughout this entire semester. But this number was not known until no earlier than 1913. Okay, the, yes, yes, we used it to talk about experiments done by, done by uh, Faraday and Maxwell and Gauss and so on and so forth. However, this number was not actually known until 1913. All right. And so this is um, for the work that, that uh, Milliken did, he, got, he received the 1923 Nobel Prize in Physics. So Milliken received the 1923 Nobel Prize in Physics for his work. All right, so again, these are all great Nobel laureates we're talking about today. Milliken is a brilliant experimental physicist. Now we can go and, and take Milliken's number, input it, combine it with um, the charge mass ratio predicted by Thompson. That's the next best thing. So we have one of the two numbers, so we can then very easily through simple algebra to get the other number. So now we can we can we can put we can uh, we can insert the uh, Q sub E obtained by Milliken into Thompson's charge to mass ratio. So what, what did Thompson know? Well, so, so essentially what, what we can basically do is what? We can, we can find the mass electron and that is equal to the charge to mass ratio Uh, divided by actually the charge, apologize, charge electron divided by the charge to mass ratio. Okay, and so we know the charge electron, negative one point six zero times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, thanks to Milliken. And we know the charge to mass ratio, thanks to Thompson. This for the electron is negative 1.76 times 10 to the 11th coulombs per kilogram. And as Thompson expected, the mass of the electron is tiny. Mass electron is 9.11 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. And this is all for the electron. All right, so the mass of the electron has been verified through many subsequent experiments and is now known better to the accuracy of one part in a million. So again, this is the first measurement of the mass electron. Uh, the mass electron has been further verified by other experiments. And 
is now known to better than one part in a million. So we understand the mass, we know the mass electron very, very well today, but this was the first measurement of it. And again, it's combining the work done by J.J. Thompson back in the turn of the century, around 1897 or so, where he found the charged mass ratio, we'll combine that with the work done by Robert A. Milliken, 1913, combine that together, now you're able to derive the, the mass of the, of, of the electron. All right, so, the mass electron is the smallest mass of any rest, uh, smallest rest mass of any particle that has a rest mass. Remember, photons have no rest mass. All right. So, so again, this measurement of the of the electron, electron is the smallest rest mass of any particle that has a rest mass. So. The electron has the smallest rest mass of any particle that has a rest mass. That's the smallest part rest mass that's known. We don't know anything smaller. Uh, photons have no rest mass. Since they can only exist at the speed of light. So again, I'm making a caveat here. They're smallest of any particle that has a rest mass. Clearly zero is smaller than 9.11 of them sending a 31. Okay, so we can also further use uh, the we can use the uh, charge mass ratio for the proton as well to determine the proton's mass. So again, using the charge mass ratio. For a proton, and um, Q sub e determined by Millikan, we find. The mass of the proton to be M sub P. And that's equal to 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. So you're going to make it bigger, bigger than the uh, electron, but again, very, very tiny. In macroscopic terms. All right, and so um, so Thompson and Millikan, um, what they had done is prove the existence of one sub substructure of atoms, the electron, and further show that there's a tiny fraction of the mass of the atom. Now, we also know that. The nucleus of the atom contains most of the mass. The nature of the, of the nucleus was, still, was, was also completely unanticipated. All right, and so, um, so again, 
those of you coming into this class have had at least enough high school chemistry or uh, to know, you know, that an atom has both a nucleus and, and electrons, right? So we're understanding electrons. Again, we still don't understand how the atom is formed, all right? So, so Thompson and Millikan, proved um, that the atom was composed of, of um, substructures And that the electron was a tiny fraction of the mass of the atom. Now, before I go on, we, 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 we also understand the atom is composed of protons too. Uh, but one of the things that Thompson was able to show was a, was a very fundamental aspect of quantum mechanics. All right. Um, so this is very important. Uh, an important... aspect of quantum mechanics has emerged. Which is the concept of indistinguishability. Every electron is, is identical. and indistinguishable from another. This is very important in, in, the, in the quantum statistics. So this, uh, this concept is crucial in quantum statistics. All right, so again, Thompson and Millikan proved that atom was composed of substructures that, are, that the electron was, and, and, and the electron was a tiny fraction of the mass of, of the atom. But an important concept, I can call the word important, important aspect of quantum mechanics has emerged, which is the concept of indistinguishability. Every electron is identical and indistinguishable from another. Um, this is a, a crucial concept in quantum statistics. You cannot, in quantum statistics, you cannot tell one electron from the other. You cannot follow, you cannot mark an electron, say, okay, I'm gonna follow this electron. And quantum mechanics are indistinguishable. 
This plays out in the statistics that, that govern quantum mechanics. If they were distinguishable, the quantum mechanics would work differently. The fact is they're indistinguishable. We cannot tell one electron from another. And again, this also applies to all protons and neutrons. All submicroscopic particles are indistinguishable. All right, so indistinguishability applies to all protons, all neutrons, all submicroscopic particles. So indistinguishability. applies to all submicroscopic particles. Not just electrons, but protons, neutrons, etc. all identical they are all indistinguishable i cannot tell i cannot put a marker on one and follow it around if i could if i could do that the statistics would be different i cannot do that okay so now um we've talked about parts of the atom we talked about the electron of course the electron is is a tiny fraction so the atom must be composed of something else so we understand we understand you know the concept of um, of um, that there's there's protons, and so what we want to do so so the idea is at the time, Thompson had Thompson had also also published what was called a plum pudding model. All right, so Thompson. So yeah, we have these electrons. But Thompson believed in the plum pudding model. So Thompson proposed the plum pudding model. In which the atom was composed of electrons and protons mixed about in a plum pudding, if you will. So imagine a plum pudding, you know, here you have your, you know, you have your atom and here might be an electron, here might be a proton and an electron and a proton and they're all just mixed about. So on and so forth, there's mixed about, all right? And so they're, they're mixed about in like, like a plum pudding. And that was the belief of what the atom looked like. We know that we're, we know they're composed of substructures. We know about protons and we know about electrons. We know electrons are tiny. So there must be a lot of protons around to make up the atom. Because electrons certainly aren't gonna account for the weight, the electrons are too small. So you have the protons, but they're all mixed about in this plum pudding. So that was the understanding of what the atom looked like at the turn of, turn of the 20th century. And so, as we start talking about the atom as a whole, and we're going to get into the nucleus now, we we start talking about uh, we we start seeing high energy particles coming out of the atom, um, and uh, we call that nuclear radio uh, radioactivity. So again, nuclear radioactivity is in terms of mega electron volts, huge energies. And so that's one of the, you know, one of the uh, mysteries is how do you have these 
particles with a very high energy coming out of coming out of these atoms. All right. So again, we have this plum pudding model, but at the same time, in about 1896, we had the discovery of radioactivity. And all this is happening around the same time. So nuclear radioactivity. Uh, was discovered in 1896. And uh, and it was and uh, it was a it was a subject of intense study. One of the things about these radioactive particles that would come out is they had very high energies. The radioactive particles had energies in MeV. Mega electron volts, millions of electron volts. Atomic energies are only electron volts, are, are only in electron volts. So where did this high energy come from? Okay, so again, so in walks uh, the next the next great physicist to talk about in our history lesson here is is a great Ernest Rutherford. So so New Zealander who's from New Zealand initially New Zealander Lord Ernest Rutherford. began to study the atom. And we'll actually find out that he's gonna study the nucleus. That's what he's gonna do. He's actually gonna, he's actually gonna study um, nuclear physics. And in fact, um, Rutherford has been called the father of nuclear physics. Now, again, around, around the turn of the century, nobody knew about that there even was a nucleus. So the father of nuclear physics, Rutherford. I do a little minor adjustments on this. All right, so again, Rutherford walks in. He is he is considered the father of nuclear physics. All right, so why why is that? All right, so let's talk a little bit about Rutherford. So Rutherford, um, so he was you know again he was born in uh, he was he was from New Zealand. Um, he um. Not lining up the Okay, sorry about that. All right, so Rutherford was originally from New Zealand, as I said. And he did his uh, postgraduate studies at the Cavendish Laboratories in England. So Rutherford did his um, his postgraduate studies in, in the Cavendish Laboratory in, in uh, England.
Okay. Um, and uh, he took up a position at McGill University in Canada, where he did the work that earned him the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1908. All right. So he, he took up. So he took a position at McGill University. in Canada uh, where he did where he did uh, the work that that uh, earned him the Nobel Prize in physics and chemistry in 1908 him Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Nineteen oh eight. All right, so um so Rutherford, um the area of atomic nuclear physics, uh there's a lot of overlap between chemistry and physics. All right, and so Rutherford, uh, he returned to England um, in later years and actually uh, had six Nobel Prize winners as students. So Rutherford was a massively uh, brilliant um, scientist and in later years, he returned to England And six of his graduate students became Nobel laureates. I don't, I don't know if anybody has ever had that many graduate students, students who became Nobel laureates. Six. So Rutherford was amazing. But why are we talking about Rutherford right here? But Rutherford wanted to look at the plum pudding model. He wanted to analyze. He wanted to analyze, you know, the atom. And so he decided, well, you know, at the time we we understood that, you know, from the radioactivity, that high high energy particles called alpha particles. Can be made, you know, uh, come out of certain uh, certain atoms. So his idea was, well, I'm going to take a high energy particle, and when I I want to shoot it at a gold foil, and I want to understand how the alpha particle will bound off of the atoms in the gold foil. I I mean. And I, I really expect most of them, because it's a plum pudding model, I expect most of them, most of them to probably go through. Or if they do collide um, with the with, with the uh, protons, they're they're not gonna, there's not gonna be much of a maybe a slight deflection in their angle. Because his picture of of the atom was just a bunch of little protons and electrons mingling around. All right. And so he sets up, so the idea is he. He set up uh, an experiment. Let me kind of show you what, what the experiment looked like. He set up an experiment where, give me a moment here. Let me go to where the picture is. Open stacks. We're leading our way now to Ernest Rutherford, Lord Ernest Rutherford. All right, so let's look at his experiment. Okay, so Rutherford wanted to, so he had a source of alpha particles. Okay, and alpha particles are doubly ionized helium nuclei. I mean, I'll write this in a moment here. In the middle of all this is a gold foil. And, and then there was a screen, kind of a almost a 360 degree screen, if you will, 
that would go and capture the uh, essentially the alpha particle after it after it uh, bounced off of a proton or electron in in the in the plum in the atom in some gold atom. Most of the gold atoms, they, they, I mean, again, you know, given that, you know, our, the model of the, of the atom at the time was just as the plum pudding model, we didn't expect to be, to see very large deflections at all. All right, and so most of the, so we would expect there to be small angle deflections and really Rutherford's just trying to understand this. So Rutherford first sent out a couple of graduate students, Geiger and Marsden. Now you've heard of Geiger from the Geiger counter. So he sends his graduate students out and they do this experiment. And they go back to their professor, Rutherford, and they say, Professor, um, we saw most of what you predicted, but some of the alpha particles were, were recoiled almost at very large angles, almost straight, almost summit straight back at us. Rutherford's like, no, no, no. You did this experiment wrong. Do it again, do it again. Um, that's not possible. So Geiger and Meyerson set up the experiment again. They did it again. And again, they saw that, yeah, most of the alpha particles went through with small deflections, but some of them were deflected at very large angles, some so large that they came right back at the, uh, at the actual alpha, alpha particle source. So they came back to Rutherford again and told him, oh, sorry, we're seeing, the same, we're seeing the same results. Rutherford, you know, gets up and says, oh, okay. You have to do, you have to, you know, do something right. Do it yourself. So he goes down there and does the experiment. He finds out the same thing: that some of these alpha particles were deflected at very large angles, some so large as to come right straight back at the actual alpha particle source. This was totally unexpected, and I'll write this down in a moment. This experimental result shows you that there is a very high dense, dense nucleus at the center of the atom, totally unexpected. And so again, let me kind of rephrase what I, you know, or write down kind of just what I said. So two graduate students, Geiger and Marston came out there to do the experiment. All right, and so the idea was, what do you expect to see? Why do you expect to see small deflections, right? So Rutherford's grad, two, so two of Rutherford's graduate students so Geiger and Marsden. Geiger, we know him from the Geiger counter. Uh, went to perform the experiment of shooting alpha particles. into a gold foil. All right, so again, I showed you that picture. Now, the idea was, the idea of the atom um, you know, the concept was, um, was that it was like a plum pudding. with protons and electrons mixed, with a mix of protons and electrons. So when the alpha particle were to go through a gold atom, Again, the 
alpha particle is basically a helium plus plus, the helium nucleus. the alpha particle, which is a helium, doubly ionized helium nucleus. Uh, would go or pass through a gold atom They would either pass through space or have a small deflection off of a proton or electron, well really electron probably wouldn't matter, but because the alpha particle has so much energy. I mean, it's like if you took a supersonic bowling ball and crashed it into some pins. I mean, a bowling ball, the pins, it's almost like the pins aren't even there. Bowling ball will just continue through because it's got, it would have very, very high energy. So we're thinking we have a very high energy, like a 5 MeV alpha particle coming through the, this gold atom. You expect at most the alpha particle would deflect by a very small angle. All right. What? Geiger and Marsden and later Rutherford found out is that not only, I mean, most of the time there were those small deflections, but sometimes there were large deflecting angles. Sometimes the alpha particle is sent straight back at the alpha, at, at the source. So again, most times, the alpha particle suffered small deflections. So the alpha particle suffered small, um, suffered small angle deflections. Which is what you would expect. As expected. But sometimes the alpha particle had large deflections. Well, some alpha particles sent straight back at the source. That is totally unexpected. All right, and so, so essentially, um, you know, the alpha particles are five MEG, MEV particles. So again, the um, we would we would not expect them to be stopped by anything. All right, and so the um, the idea here is that the um, 
So it's, it's this is kind of analogous. To a, I would say, a, how a bowling ball would, how a high energy bowling ball would scatter off pins. But to find out, that the bowling ball will come straight back at you. That would be a surprise. Right? We wouldn't expect that to happen. We would expect that to happen if the bowling ball were to hit a, a big pole, a big pole or something. You know, we might expect this. If the bowling ball struck a immovable pole. They struck a telephone pole. All right, so what this um, what this really comes down to is that um, Rutherford is seeing the um, that there must be a nucleus, a very dense nucleus at the center at the center of the atom. That's the only way to describe the large angles. I mean, that, that the entire mass of the nucleus must be concentrated at the center of the atom. Clearly, in order to be able to have a head-on collision like that, where where the or something is as energetic and as massive as an alpha particle, I mean, again, it's not a helium nucleus, but it's coming in very high energies. For that to be sent straight back, uh, you know, again, have small numbers sent straight back means that it's hitting a very massive, dense object. And that would be that, so essentially what, what uh, Thompson is able to see with these large angles is that in further detailed analysis that the gold nucleus is very small compared with the total atom. So, um, you know, so the plum pudding model is incorrect. So Rutherford did further analysis. To Rutherford, perform further analyses and showed that the nucleus, that the atom was composed of a very dense, very small, dense nucleus, positive nucleus, Surrounded by electrons, by negative electrons. All 
all right? And um, and that's that's the only way you're going to have a head-on collision like this. And, and so essentially what ends up being is that um, the mass, the uh, all of the um, of the uh, or almost all the mass of the atom uh, is in this in this nucleus. Almost the entire mass of the atom is in this nucleus, since electrons don't really account for much anything at all. So almost all the mass of the atom. is in this very dense nucleus. All right, now, all we knew about were, uh, were protons at the time. It'll be later found out that even with the number of, elect of, even the number of protons, you couldn't account for all the mass. That led to the discovery later on of the neutron. But uh, again, we see that um, even in Thompson, and I'm sorry, like, like Planck, like Thompson, Rutherford also was a little shy to publish his results. And uh, so, so again, Rutherford like Planck and Thompson were initially reticent to publish their results. All right. Um, <clears throat> So essentially, his colleagues published the results by 1909, but it took Tom Rutherford another two years to convince himself of their meaning. All right, and so Rutherford uh, is later quoted. Um, a nice quote by Rutherford. I always like to give it as well. So Rutherford, so Rutherford stated later. And this kind of tells you his line of thinking at the time. He was, you know, again, he was, uh, this is such an incredible finding that a nucleus is so dense that the atom is really com mostly composed of a nucleus that's even much, much smaller than what the atom was, about 100,000 times smaller. But Rutherford, Rutherford later stated that he said it was, it was almost as incredible. It's almost as incredible as if you fired a 15 inch shell um, at a piece of tissue paper. And it came back and hit you. Um, so basically, on consideration, I realized that this scattering backwards. So on a uh, on consideration, I realized that this scattering backwards
meant um, the great, that the greatest part of the atom or the greatest part of the, of the mass of the atom was concentrated in a tiny nucleus. All right, so Rutherford's statement is, it was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15 inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. On consideration, I realized that this scattering backwards meant that the greatest part of the mass of an electron was concentrated in a tiny nucleus. All right, and so 1911, Rutherford published his analysis and he also proposed a public a, uh, a model of the atom. So we have a revised model of the atom published by Rutherford. So again, um, Rutherford finally believed that this uh, meant that the nucleus was, this very tiny nucleus was the center of the atom. So um, in 1911, <clears throat> Rutherford published his analysis together with the with a proposed model of the atom. I mean, his colleagues had public, started publishing two years prior to him. All right, and so the size of the nucleus was determined to be about 10 to the negative 15 meters. Here's Rutherford's analysis. The size of the nucleus was determined to be about 10 to the negative 15 meters across. Okay, again, 10 to 15, that's 100,000 times smaller than the atom. All right, that's one, uh, you know, so again, this is, uh, so the density supplies a huge density of, the, of mass density. So the mass density of the nucleus is on the order of, Ten to the fifteenth grams per centimeter cubed, vastly unlike any macroscopic matter. No macroscopic matter is like this. Maybe maybe the very center of a black hole, but vastly unlike. Any macroscopic matter, no. I mean, the sheer density of nuclear, nuclear matter. Just imagine, you know, the density of water is a thousand, um, 
uh, or a gram, oh, actually density of water is one gram per centimeter cube, right? We're talking about 10 to the 15th grams per centimeter cube. This is the density, the incredible density of nuclear matter. Okay, so this is what this means that, you know, that, and this is one of, one of the things that made Rutherford a little shy at publishing at first, because these are, these are insane numbers, 10 to the negative 15 meters across for the diameter of a nucleus, you know, where the, where the atom itself is 100,000 times bigger. The atom's already small. The nucleus is even significantly even smaller than that. And of all the matter, the atom is essentially located in this tiny central nucleus. That means that the density of this matter is on the order of an incredible 10 to the 15th grams per centimeter cubed. And these are numbers that are very hard to believe. The other thing it implies is you're talking about a bunch of protons being shoved together into a very small space. Protons don't like to be together, right? They are all positive charges. They, they have a Coulomb repulsion. So this implies that there are other short range nuclear forces that hold them together, all right? So, That's what else this implies. We need, we need other forces. There, you know, so far we had two fundamental forces, you know, a gravitation, electromagnetic force. We need more forces now. All right. So, so also implied is the existence of a, a previously unknown nuclear forces. Um, to counteract the huge repulsive Coulomb force among the positive charges in the nucleus. So the protons shoved together in a, in a tiny nucleus. They don't want to be near each other. I'm sorry, the pulse of Coulomb force, I apologize. So again, also implied is the existence of previously unknown nuclear forces to counteract the large repulse of Coulomb force between the protons shoved together in the tiny nucleus. Protons do not like to be together. They do not mean to be put together in a small space. So there, there are very, very large repulsive Coulomb forces, electros electrostatic forces between the protons being shoved together in this very, very tiny nucleus. The nuclear forces that hold them together have to even be greater than these. And indeed they are. We'll talk more about that in the next chapter. All right. So the small size of the nucleus means that the atom is mostly empty space. Or mostly empty inside. All 
All right. And so, and again, Rutherford's experiments show that. Rutherford found out that most of the uh, of the uh, alpha particles hit nothing. All right. So Rutherford saw this. Rutherford saw that most alpha particles hit nothing. So they were not deflected and hit nothing. It's just some of them came back at a very large angle. All right. And again, if, if, the, if the atom is mostly empty space, that makes sense. You would most of the time hit nothing because most of the time you would hit, you would be running up against empty space. Okay. So again, that's, that also makes sense. Um, so based on the size and the mass of the nucleus, um, Rutherford proposed what was called now a planetary model of the atom. All right. And so he thought it made most sense that the, that the, there was a planetary model of the atom. All right, so based on the mass and size of the nucleus, Rutherford proposed the planetary model of the atom. Okay, planetary model of the atom. Um, it pictures Low mass electrons orbiting a, a large mass nucleus. All right, and so you think of it as like, here's the, the massive nucleus in the center, positive, and surrounding it in nice, nice uh, elliptical orbit or circular orbits, I guess, would be electrons. Here's the orbit. Another orbit, very much like planets. All right, and so again, I didn't draw this very nicely, but again, you, you get the point. The planet, the electrons are, are orbiting around with an orbital velocity, just like planets, all right? And so Rutherford pictured, uh, so Rutherford's picture is a massive, nucleus orbited by low mass electrons. Or in circular orbits. Much like lower mass planets orbit the sun. Okay, and then of course. 
what's the what's the attractive force or what you know planets of the sun well it's the central central gravitational force what's the attractive force for electrons orbiting the positive nucleus it's the central coulomb force and the gravitational force and the coulomb force have a very similar form so everything seems to make sense all right and so so in this picture Now we have the central force at play. So the central force governing planetary motion or governing the planetary motion or the orbits of planets. about the sun is the central gravitational force. Right? F's of gravitation. It's, we'll make it a vector. Uh, G, mass of the sun times the mass of a planet divided by their center to center distance squared R hat, right? Well, in the same manner, the central force governing the orbits of electrons. about the positive nucleus, about the positive, massive, again, the sun is massive compared to the planets, central nucleus is the central, central electrostatic force or the central Coulomb force. called a central force. And that's again, F subelectric is K. Q sub E, and then times another Q sub E. Q sub E for the planet, Q sub E from the, uh, from the uh, charge, well, we'll, we'll just say, um, Q electron, Q nucleus, divided by the center to center distance squared. Again, a lot of things are similar. All right. And so it makes a lot of sense. You know, now the, um, we're going to find out that the, in our further studies of quantum mechanics that the planetary model has a problem with it or a major problem within that. Well, first of all, you know, the planetary model is stating here that the, that the electron paths are well-defined. We know from the highest work certainty principle, that's not, that's not possible. So quantum mechanics is eventually gonna show that the planetary model is going to have uh, problems, but again, we, we were not at this point developed enough in quantum mechanics to even realize that. All right, so this is a, this is a, a good start. And in fact, we're gonna, in, a, in, the next sec, in the next section I cover, we're gonna find out that Bohr, Niels Bohr, used this model to actually show the spectral lines of hydrogen. So, you know, so the issue with, this model right off the bat, you know, again, it's exciting. It's exciting to see that, you know, we have this planetary model and, and, it, and it's um, very compelling, you know, the, you know the, the comparisons I've made already, right? But the planetary model
assumes well-defined or orbits. I.e., we can know precisely where an electron is. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle states that this is impossible. So again, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle as we talked about in chapter 29, uh, states that you cannot know the position and momentum any better than what is governed by, again, I was doing a one dimension, but delta x times delta p sub x must be greater than, greater than or equal to h over four pi. Again, delta x is the uncertainty in measuring x. And delta p sub x, that's the uncertainty in the x momentum or x component momentum. So the well-defined orbits part is a problem. Um, now, the uh, we find out that the dis that this planetary model can be used very well for hydrogen, but you know for all other um, atoms it, it cannot, right? And um, so. So the planetary model will find, so we will find that um, Bohr, Niels Bohr, and I'll talk about him next, had great success. In applying the planetary model to hydrogen, and hydrogen is the first element, just one proton, one electron. But we cannot apply it to the other. Uh, 92, the other 91 elements, uh, 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 other 91 naturally occurring elements. Okay. 
And we also find out that, you know, as far as we understand, the uh, electron is a fundamental particle. But further studies have shown that the, that the nucleus is composed of protons and neutrons. And in fact, the protons and neutrons are com further composed of quarks, all right? And so, you know, we'll, we will find Uh, so we know, so we find that the, the electron looks like a fundamental particle. So the electron looks like it's indivisible. The electron uh, is a fundamental particle. But further studies, show, again, we won't, we won't talk about this in this class. This is beyond the scope of this class, but further studies show that the protons and neutrons that compose the nucleus consists of even smaller quarks. quarks. All right, so, uh, so I leave you with that today, I'm um, finished. In this video, and we'll start the, the next video with a discussion of uh, the analysis performed by uh, Niels Bohr on the hydrogen atom.